You know, if you play the Terror's theme at double speed, it sounds like Victorian Gabber. Awesome. Episode 3 is called The Ladder. It's a reference to Jacob's Ladder. The men are still in watch, looking out for the tumbak, which they assume is an unusually large polar bear. These two are Solomon Tozer, Marine Sergeant, and George Chambers, Erebus's last remaining cabin boy. Tozer was assigned to Terror, not Erebus, in real life, and it never comes up in the show, but he was Jewish. The Marines were the only non-volunteers in the mission. They were the worst paid, got no danger bonuses, were there to guard the crews against whatever they found, and to quell mutiny, but also to do the least skilled and hardiest jobs. William Brain, the Marine who died at Beach Island, was manhauling not long before he died. They found the unhealed marks in his body. I mentioned them not giving a crap at Inuit customs and shoving the shaman's body into an ice hole in the last video, but they actually do it in this episode, ignoring Lady Silence's demands that they take him out to the ice to die, so the Tumbat could find him. Why? Ritual stuff that Dan Simmons invented. Both Silence and her father are as fictional as a Tumbak. More so, technically, since Simmons sort of based it in actual myth. Kinda. A bit. I'll talk about it later. The ice hole was also a problem because to Silence and the Shaman's people, the body continues to feel pain after death. So they trapped him forever in a frozen hell. And when I said the Shaman and Silence were more fictional than the Tumbak, I mean as individuals. Much of the beliefs are heavily inspired by actual Inuit tradition. To make matters worse, for the crews, one of them steals an ivory charm from the shaman's corpse. An ivory charm in the shape of the tumbak. Silence is released and begins making herself an igloo not far from the ships. In the flash forward in episode 1, we saw some local Inuit living in tents made from skins. Both of these are accurate. What kind of shelter they'd build would depend on a bunch of factors, including the time of year, the weather, and the amount of snow. Franklin has a flashback to before the expedition sailed, when Sir John Ross quizzes him what kind of escape plan he has, should the expedition go wrong. I'm honestly impressed they put John Ross in here. Most shows would unite the two veteran polar explorers called Sir J. Ross into one character. Sir John Ross was the uncle of Sir James Clark Ross, Crozier's friend. Ross's question and his reaction to Franklin's admission that he has no escape plan is a little unfair. Your rescue plan. What is your rescue plan? I have followed every Admiralty protocol. You leaked your shoes again. You leaked worse. Seeing as Franklin wasn't in control of any escape plans, the Admiralty, which included Sir John Ross, was. Few people with any degree of influence even thought an escape plan was even necessary. Though Ross did suggest that Franklin leave stores of food along the coast in case he had to walk out. But Ross had survived being icebound in a starvation march himself, so that makes sense. Not sure whether made him English, though, he was Scottish. And even if something like this did happen, it didn't happen like this. John Ross and Franklin were very good friends, and Ross told him that, should he disappear, he would search for him, even if no one else would. And at age 74, he came out of retirement and did just that. Ross warns Franklin that when faced with starvation, his men would turn on him, and this is sort of accurate. When Ross had his own starvation march, he had an angry crew who wanted to abandon the boats and march pulling only sledges. Icemaster Blanky spoke for them and Ross refused and saw it as a mutiny. But it was all dealt with without violence and afterwards Blanky got a letter of recommendation that got him his own merchant ship. So his paranoia seems a bit over the top. And 134 starved men will turn devil against you, starting with the ones you hold closest. The ship's monkey, Jacko, really was a gift for the expedition from Lady Franklin. She hoped the men would have fun dressing up in costumes to pass the time. This scene brings up the Franklin's reasons for him applying for the expedition in the first place. It was an attempt to regain face after being unceremoniously recalled as the governor of Tasmania. Like an Erebus, Franklin ran a pretty loose ship down under, and eventually his relationship with his assistant John Montague disintegrated so much that Montague returned to London and got Lord Stanley, Franklin's superior, to recall him. Lady Franklin, being such a strong woman, didn't help either. Still, the Franklins were beloved by the people of Tasmania. Franklin was a much more lenient governor than the British Empire usually employed, setting up a museum and university and opening up the governor's private gardens for public use. Within years of his fate being discovered, the site of the original governor's mansion had been renamed Franklin Square and a statue set up in his honour. Crozier and Franklin's dust-up, or something close to it, seems a bit unlikely to have happened in real life. Even if it is a really good scene. I will not lose another man, Francis. We may lose all our men. You are the worst kind of second fathers. 
Franklin from the history books doesn't seem like the sort of man who would eviscerate Crozier like that. There are some things we were never meant to be to one another. Friends on my side, relations on yours. Crozier, though, is perfectly in line with the man from the history books. Doubtless there were some kind of arguments, but I doubt they were this intense, at least from Franklin. About Crozier's plan to send men south, there is an actual theory that the Victory Point message might be referring to such an effort, and not to the mass exodus that we usually assume. In a way, if they did send parties out to find help, they probably didn't just go south. Fury Beach, the location of stores and supplies where John Ross and his crew were rescued, is closer to King William Island than the Hudson's Bay Company, and evidence of men was found along the north side of King William Island, probably heading east and maybe to Fury Beach, though that could have been part of the mass exodus later on. There's a lot of maybes when dealing with the Franklin expedition. Franklin's reasons for not agreeing to Crozier's plan, that he had lost men in the area before, is accurate. He lost more than half his men in his first Arctic expedition, in the land south of King William Island. There was starvation, cannibalism, and murder. It was the Franklin Expedition beta test. Crozier's decision to send men south anyway and lead him himself is very unlikely. Crozier was 50, and an 800-mile march was way beyond anything he'd experience with. And between the two of them, Franklin had the polar land travel experience. If he really talked about sending a team without Franklin's okay, it'd make much more sense to send Blanky if only to increase the chance of success. Remember, Blanky had done an Arctic starvation march before and lived. And send me in your place. I can speak native as well as you. You must stay to read the ice. In real life, Crozier had more than enough experience to do a passable job at reading the ice. He didn't even have an ice master when they braved 100 miles of pack ice in Antarctica. Gibson talked to Irving about the stuff he saw last episode. He tells him that Hickey seduced and almost raped him. Irving keeps quiet to protect Gibson, and this can't have had a positive effect on Hickey's mental health. Mr. Gibson told me everything. How you pressed him into service. I pressed him. This is just so you have some context for stuff in later videos, in case you didn't see the show. But it feels wrong not to hit you with some history, so pressing into service is a reference to press ganging, when the British Navy would recruit people through beatings or replying them with drink. The practice unofficially ended in 1814, and it's never been used since. There's a brief talk about problems with the canned food between Erebus and Terror's cooks, Mr. Wall and Mr. Diggle. The contents are often spoiled. Canned food was a new invention when the expedition launched, and Goldner, the man who was in charge of the canning, did the job in the cheap. Spoiled food was actually one of the lesser problems reported with his cans in other voyages. There were half-full cans weighed down with rocks and bone, botulism, and of course, lead. But I'll get to that later. The crews have built a hunting blind to try and kill the tumbak, still believing it to be an unusually large polar bear. The marines are camping out and waiting for it to stick its head out so they can shoot it off. I'm unsure this would have worked on the best of days, seeing as on Beachy Island they shot a bear and didn't even pierce its skin. We know this because the next ship to visit the island killed the bear and found the evidence. Franklin's come to encourage the marines, bringing Dr. Goodsir with the ship's camera. This is real. They had a daguerreotype on board, but it's never been found, and neither have any plates. It's unlikely, but somewhere on King William Island, or in the seas around, there might be pictures of the expedition waiting to be found. It wouldn't be the first time that such photos were found and processed. In the late Victorian era, some Swedish adventurers tried to fly a balloon over the North Pole. They died, but before they did, they took a lot of photographs, which were recovered and processed decades later. If you remember the start of Episode 1, James Ross shows pictures of Franklin, Fritz James, and Crozier. They were taken by a man named Richard Beard, and I think the camera taken on the expedition was the same one he used to take those. The photos were taken either on or beside the Erebus. That's why we have photos of all the Erebus' officers and only Crozier from Terror. Franklin waits with the Marines for the tomb back. They set up a display of dead rats to draw it near, but it attacks from above and kills one of the Marines. Franklin tries to get back to the ship. Erebus! I've seen commentators call him out for cowardice in this scene, but I disagree. He didn't have a gun. What else could he have done? Fitzjames leads another squad of marines into the ice, without a thought for his own safety. This is entirely in character. During his military career, he regularly volunteered for dangerous missions or tried to be the first man into battle. Franklin has grabbed the tomb back, his leg is ripped off, and he's jammed headfirst into the same ice hole the shaman was dropped into. This is just irony. In the book, Franklin had both his legs torn off and was thrown into the sea. He then got his head above water and had it torn off by the tomb back. Book Franklin is almost as hard to kill as Ice Master Blanky. We don't know how the real Sir John Franklin died, just the date of his death. 
There's circumstantial evidence that suggests it was a lingering death. Fitzjames signed some stuff from the Victory Point message that Franklin should have, well before he died, so it's very likely he was weak. It's accepted by most people who study the expedition that Franklin was buried below ground in the north of King William Island, and his grave was sealed with a kind of concrete. This is based on Inuit accounts of an officer's funeral. A pole or a cross was left to mark the spot, but it's since vanished. There's a few other less popular ideas, like Franklin's body was pickled for an eventual return to England, like Nelson's was, and might be found in a barrel either on or somewhere near the wreck of the Erebus. Or that the grave and the officer's funeral that the Inuit saw might have been for another officer. We just don't know. All we do know is that Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, assuming Fitzjames got the date right, which he might not have. He got the years wrong in the same message. The coffin we see good sir put Franklin's leg into is an accurate recreation of the coffins the actual expedition brought. They were assembled, Ikea style as needed. After Franklin's death, Crozier is all business. He knows time is short. Proceed immediately with the rescue party. Well, Fitzjames is overcome with grief. Now, Fitzjames was a passionate man, but he was also a seasoned soldier, so I think his reaction is a little over the top. We have lost Sir John! We we have lost Sir John. I've seen no evidence that Fitzjames was particularly close to Franklin. The chances are they did become close over the years in the ice, but Fitzjames knew Gore for many, many years. This grief probably should have happened last episode. The party Crozier sending south to contact the Hudson Bay Company is led by Lieutenant Fairholm, owner of the jauntiest cap on either of the ships, and will head it after a day to grief for the captain. Able seaman John Morphin sings a song for Franklin. Farewell All Joys by Orlando Gibbons, sometimes known as the Silver Swan Song. It's from the late 16th century and about the idea that swans will only sing right before they're about to die. And yes, that's the origin of the term swan song. Farewell all joys. Crozier has to get himself drunk to handle speaking at Franklin's funeral. In the show, and I suspect real life, he's an awkward public speaker and personally shy. He slurs his way through Franklin's eulogy for Commander Gore the eulogy Franklin was going to give that very day. In the book, if Crozier has to lead prayers, he'd sometimes quote Leviathan from Thomas Hobbes instead of the Bible, leading some of his men to believe it's an obscure part of the Bible. Crozier's a bit more of a misanthrope in the book. He's also an atheist in the book. In the show, we never find out his religious leanings. I think they were going for unspoken atheism, but I'm not sure. In real life, there's no evidence that he wasn't a Christian. If the real-life Inuit reports of the funeral are correct, and it was Franklin's, then the location of this funeral is wrong. It happened far from the ships, on King William Island itself. We end the episode with Silence receiving a gift from the tomb back. She can't control it, but it knows who its master should be.